ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ವ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಹೀ ಬೈ ಹೂಮ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎಜುಟೇಟೆಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ಕೆನ್ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿ ಎಜುಟೇಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ರೀಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಜಾಯ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಫಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಂಗ್ಸೈಟಿ ಹೀ ಇಸ್ ಡಿಯರ್ ಟು ಮೀ ದ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಂಪ್ಲಾಯ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಹೀ ಬೈ ಹೂಮ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಎಜುಟೇಟೆಡ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಇನ್ ಡೀಟ್ ಎಜುಟೇಟೆಡ್ ಸಮ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ದೆಮ್ ರಾಮ್ ಎಜುಟೇಟೆಡ್ ರಾವಣ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಎಜುಟೇಟೆಡ್ ಕನ್ಸ್ ದುರ್ಯೋಧನ್ ಎಕ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ನೀಡ್ ಟು ಅಪಿಯರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಎಜುಟೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫೀವರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟರ್ಬುಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ ವೈ ಡಿಡ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಅಸ್ಯೂಮ್ ಅ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ನೆಸ್ by its nature loves to remain latent and unmanifest greatness does not enjoy exhibition hmm? exhibitionism does not sit well with truth truth is quite a sleepy thing it does not want to display itself hmm? it just remains relaxed sleeping tucked away in some corner away from the public eye only when there is some great exigency that the truth wakes up and exhibits or manifests itself otherwise the truth loves being a non doer otherwise the truth maintains a hands off approach krishna clarifies it he says only when the world experiences a total fall in values and defeat of dharma do i come over to save the sages and punish the evil ones he qualifies it very clearly yada yada hi dharma se only when dharm experiences a decline or fall or attack do i come over aha uh-huh, right so when dharm is not experiencing a decline or fall then what does krishna do he sleeps truth is as i said quite sleepy truth is not exhibitionist are you getting it so they came over only because these chaps ravan or kans or duryodhan they were creating a fair bit of ruckus in the world they were causing commotion and disturbance and all kinds of upheavals therefore a ram or a krishna had to appear they did not appear to agitate anybody they appeared because of pre existing agitation and the result of their appearance was that the agitation subsided so obviously they did not come to agitate they came to become the agitation is that not so was the world more peaceful before krishna than after it no think of the environment in which krishna took birth so many of his elder siblings had been mercilessly slaughtered by kans ha huh? his parents had been imprisoned on mere suspicion and then he had to be sneaked out of the prison cell and 
furtively carried away to some village across the Yamuna. Do you see how agitated those times must have been? The king that was dealing with Krishna's biological parents in this way surely was not dealing with the rest of population in a very benevolent way. Or was he? Was Kans selectively cruel towards Krishna's parents? Obviously he was not. He was a cruel ruler in general. Therefore evil was ruling. And therefore Krishna had to come. The ascendance of evil is necessarily accompanied by the arrival of someone to counter that evil. It's a rule. It is as if evil carries within itself the news of arrival of a Krishna. If you find evil rising immeasurably, then you should know that a special force is about to arrive to counter the evil. That special force will not always be in the form of a person. But the force would nevertheless always arrive. As they say that it is darkest before dawn. If it is very very dark, you must know that the sun is about to arrive. Are you getting it? So, what's implied by he by whom the world is not agitated because by their constitution all human beings are configured, conditioned to only agitate the world. Rare is the one, the net presence of, the net effect of whose presence is that the overall agitation in the atmosphere comes down. Otherwise, if you look at any person in the world, he would have only contributed agitation to the world by dint of his presence. It's almost like entropy. It only increases. Agitation I'm talking of. A fellow is born. Hmm? And the fellow dies. And there are 70 years between these two events. What did he do through these 70 years? Effectively, he just agitated the world. Hmm? The sum total of his life is agitation. The net effect of his presence on the world around him is agitation. That's what everybody does without exception. Now, the one who comes to the world and leaves the world more peaceful than how he found it is called a Krishna. Are you getting it? He by whom the world is not agitated. And he adds here, uh, Krishna, he by whom the world is not agitated and he who cannot be agitated by the world. And these two necessarily go together. If the world agitates you, then you will react to agitate the world. Therefore, a Krishna has to be someone who is not excitable. The world will not mean much to him. Victory and defeat will not mean much to him. You cannot lure him, you cannot tempt him, and you cannot threaten him. You cannot display your power and bow him down into submission. At the same time, you cannot display your weakness and arouse his pity. He is not there to exploit you and he will not allow you to exploit him. He is himself. He is firm. He stands at his place. That is Krishna. Are you getting it? He neither excites someone nor is excitable. He neither threatens someone nor can be threatened. He neither exploits someone nor can be exploited. Only such a person leaves the world in a better shape than how he found it. Are you getting it? In between, obviously, you will find that Ram is, is embroiled in a fierce battle against Ravan and, and thousands are being killed and you will say, ah, 
is this what you call as arrival of peace is this person shri ram the harbinger of peace there was no battle there was no battle at all lanka appeared a peaceful city and a country by all means and see what is the effect of ram's arrival on lanka so many are being killed no you are looking at the smaller picture you are looking only at a period of let's say 10 days or 2 months in that period you will find lot of agitation but when you will take the net result when you look at the bigger picture then you will find that that battle was necessary that agitation that excitement was necessary in order to bring down the overall agitation and tension in the air so do not misjudge and we have misjudged krishna has been for example accused of being very very violent he have been accused of instigating a war hmm? arjun was trying to somehow peacefully drop his weapons he was saying no no i don't want to fight i am ready to run away and all that there would have been uh, either a surrender uh, from the side of pandavas or some kind of an armistice krishna didn't allow that to happen krishna said no you have to fight and when the fight happened then a large number of people lost their lives so it has been said that you see krishna is responsible for the war and for the bloodshed that's not true you're looking at the smaller picture what if the war hadn't happened what if the pandavas had surrendered meekly what if duryodhan had obtained the throne think of what would have happened the king used to be an absolute autocrat in those times absolute authority would be vested in the king and if someone like duryodhan would be sitting atop the most powerful kingdom of those times that would have meant very uh, bad things for the entire indian region krishna could not have allowed something so inauspicious to happen therefore the war had to happen yes a lot of lives were lost in that war but we fail to imagine how many lives were saved because of the war therefore we sometimes call a krishna as violent or something are you getting it if you have a tumor hmm that keeps bleeding within you you will probably not realize how much blood you are really losing or would you you have a tumor and the tumor keeps bleeding you would probably not realize how much blood you are losing on a daily basis and then the surgeon operates on you hmm and when the surgeon operates on you there is a visible loss of blood correct and you start accusing the surgeon oh because of you i lost so much of blood you see it's been a really bloody surgery so much of blood i can see all this blood you're talking of all this blood merely because you can see it what about all the blood that you are losing without even seeing hmm? so that's the kind of analogy that will help you understand why wars are necessary sometimes to avoid bloodshed hmm? and this is not an endorsement of wars right it's just that in life everything is all right at its proper place the intention has to be right and if the intention is right then everything is all right if the intention is to establish dharma then war can sometimes be right but only when the war is honestly and sincerely being fought to establish or defend dharma otherwise not 
Wars obviously bring about a lot of misery. Wars are to be avoided to the maximum extent possible. And that's exactly what Krishna too tried to avoid the war. He went to the extent of offering Duryodhan a deal in which he had to concede just five villages to Pandavas. But Duryodhan was not prepared to give up even on five villages. And then Krishna knew that there is no way out except a big holy fight. The war had to happen. Therefore, agitations, disturbances, turbulences are obviously something we have to avoid because the mind's final destination is peace. But it just so happens sometimes that if you are to reach peace, you have to pass through a lot of turbulence and you have to be very manfully prepared for it. You cannot buckle down. You just cannot give up at that moment. And you cannot start saying that if I want peace, if peace is my ultimate aim, then why am I fighting? Sometimes it's important to fight for peace. Hmm?